Hey guys, Dustin Nguyen. Hey, this is Scott Snyder. This is Paul Dini. And you're listening to Bat Force Radio. And you're listening to Bat Force Radio. You're listening to Bat Force Radio. This is Kevin Conroy, the voice of Batman. And you're listening to Bat Force Radio, so stay tuned. Welcome back to Bat Force Radio. Thank you again for spending your comic time with us. We've got Grandpa Batman here in Texas. Howdy, it's hot as hell. <laughs> yeah, no, Texas, hot as yeah. <laughs> Man, can't imagine. How are you doing over there? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm staying inside the air conditioner. Okay, well, that's about all the time we've got for you, Gramps. Uh, yeah, this you. week's guest is an Eisner Award <laughs> winner who has had her writing hands in the worlds of Hawkeye, Black Widow, Jessica Jones, Captain Marvel, the X-Men, and Deadpool, among many others. In addition to currently ongoing titles like Black Cloak at Image Comics, she will debut a new lineup of the Birds of Prey in a new series for DC Comics in September, as well as the one that has most of my attention, a horror adventure series called The Cull, beginning August 16th, also at Image Comics. Welcome to the show, Kelly Thompson. Thank Yay. you so, thank thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. I have to say, that was one of the best intros I've ever had. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, well done. I made it all myself. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> I I approve. Well, that's that's a good way to start off with mutual approval. We can uh, <laughs> it can only go down from here. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That's how I like to roll. Yeah, it's good. So, how are things in your part of the world? Where Where is your part of the world? Good. My part of the world is Portland, Oregon. It's hot oh, here cool. too, but not nearly as hot as Texas, thank God. Um, it's I probably think it's warmer like, than Canada. <laughs> yeah, I probably got it on YouTube, but yeah, I think we're around eighty. It's pretty hot for Portland, yeah. but um, you know, we're we don't really have we have AC window units, so mm. if we're smart about it like how we you know keep the shades drawn and you know if we if we play the game with the house and the sun we can stay cool pretty much most of the day but uh it's uh it's a uh, it's a sad game i feel like every topic we're talking about i'm just immediately drawn into like the dark side i'm sorry i don't know what's going on saturday night i'm like we've, we've i'm like i guess our, our we, shouldn't have, we shouldn't have broken the planet i guess like every path we're taking me down i don't know I'll, i can probably find something dark for barbie if we want to go there so oh. Uh, oh, anyway man. anyway there, there, there is some dark about barbie jesus did you ever watch that show the toys that made us Oh, the toys that made us is so oh. good. It's yeah, so that good. episode they did on Barbie, like the guy that designed the body bought a, a mansion in like the Hollywood Hills or something, <laughs> had it turned into a castle with a moat around it and a sex dungeon in the basement. Jeez, people are crazy. And then there was that lady that was, I don't know, one of the heads and she had that human skin sculpture thing draped over a chair beside her and no one talked about it <laughs> i don't remember that at all oh maybe, go watch it again maybe, it haunts maybe my nightmares we didn't, maybe we didn't get through the barbie episode we might have to go back and look um yeah, i i don't it's worth i feel it. like Man, we watched them all because freaks. they're all so good but i do not remember skin on, <laughs> on <laughs> maybe you sofa. blocked it out <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah or else it gets the nose again well let's see what uh, other dark sides we can find uh yes, we like to yes. start off with people with getting their origin story so i want to get into your origin story in in writing in comics what was that first thing that uh, that you remember whether it was as a child or whenever that made you realize this is what you want to do because you had a a history in the world of comics before becoming a writer so how did all of that come about so i wanted to be a writer from when i was really little um one of my early memories is being like six maybe five or six and writing a little book about mermaids and i then 
stapled it all together with like a construction paper cover and I like cut out a circle from the construction like made my own die cut book at like five or six because I not only wanted to write this thing down but like I wanted to share it with people I wanted to have it. so it was very like that's what I want to do early on I did discover comics when I was very young in the form of Archie's that I could get at the grocery store, which I would beg my mom for. And I was in love with them. And I don't even think I really understood why I loved them so much. Like they were just sort of there. And then I just, it's the thing we were talking about before about if you read comics as a kid, it's just innate, you know? And so I'm very grateful that I discovered that when I did, but it was, it wasn't until I was a teen that I actually found comic stores and the monthly thing and like floppies and the whole world of comics it, it didn't happen until i was a teenager and it came about like many people of a certain age because my brother and i my younger brother and i saw the x-men the animated series and we loved it and then he came home from the mall one day jumping up and down going it's the girl from the cartoon it's the girl from the cartoon and he had uh, uncanny x-men 290 with storm on the cover mm -hmm. and that became my first floppy comic and i was a goner that was it you know i'd been wanting to write all that time but and like you know you thought oh okay i'll write novels and then at some point you get an awareness of like oh people write tv and people write film maybe i could do that or well, that seems really hard and and it was when i found comics again as a teen it just clicked it just clicked into place like that was it and not that I wouldn't do other writing, but like that was the one that was the one that just like really made sense to my heart and my head. So that's how I uh, got in. Wow. And then what was your uh, as I mentioned, you did have a, a history in the 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 space of comics before sure. uh, getting into them. Uh, so you want to talk about what uh, what that sure initial uh, delving sure. into the world was and how that started? Sure. It's not terribly exciting. Um, but I, so that was when I was a teenager and then I went to, um, the university of Arizona. Um, I was just going to study graphic design. Maybe I didn't know, you know, you go in as a freshman, it was like a very general course load or whatever. And then in the second year I started taking some more, some more art level classes, including a graphic design class and a computer animation class and illustration class, stuff like that. And I really liked the graphic design class. And so I thought, okay, cool. Maybe this is going to be the thing for me. But the local comic book store was right off campus. It was called Captain Spiffy's. I don't believe it's there anymore. It was a great shop with a guy who really fucking loved comics like he, i mean a great shop I, I i had a great shop when i was in high school and i was worried about finding one and it was great i was so lucky and he was such a big fan he used to do a zine like a captain spiffy zine where he would get local himself and local artists would put together the zine and so i did a couple really bad stories that hopefully nobody will ever find <laughs> um <laughs> truly truly terrible because i drew them also uh, they were equally bad on both fronts. And, um, but so I had this graphic design cl class that I really liked, and I'm thinking I'm going to be a graphic designer for my life. And I, we had this assignment that I really liked, which was to design a, like a logo and concept for a drink, an alcoholic drink. And then if you wanted to do the extra credit, you could, which was like a carrying case, like a six pack holder or like whatever you wanted to do. And you could design that and build it. And that would be extra credit. And I really liked the assignment. And so I thought I'm going to do the extra credit. I'm going to, I'm going to do the extra credit on this one. So I turn it, I go in, I turn it in. Every single fucking person did the extra credit. <laughs> and I went home and I was like, I am never going to be good enough at this because when these people go home, they're still thinking about graphic design and I'm thinking about comic books. And I transferred to SCAD the next year. Like I had been thinking about it. I had been feeling like I wasn't in the right place. And it was like, that was the moment. And I've, I've realized, I've told this story a lot of times over the years and people are always blown away because they're like, I wish I'd had that moment. And so I'm very aware of how lucky I was that I like had that crossroads, recognized it for what it was, had a talk with myself and like made the right call. And I transferred to SCAD and as, as a result, here we are today. 
uh, there were a lot of annoying, <laughs> frustrating years in between that point and this point. Um, I, uh, I eventually, I lived in LA for a while and worked in architecture in admin, not as an architect, obviously. I then moved to New York and I worked in more architecture out here, out there. And, um, eventually I began blogging in like 2007 to 2009. And that was when I got tapped to do some work at CBR and comics should be good. That turned into doing reviews for publishers weekly and writing for other sites like lit reactor and stuff like that. And, but, you know, because I started in sort of comics criticism and essays and podcasting and everything, I got a really big dose of harassment, like really? right out of the, yeah, right out of the gate when I was starting up. I think 20, I think 2009 was when I really started blogging big time on comics should be good and comic book resources and stuff. And um, yeah, I mean, the, ha the harassment was incredible. I mean, the things people said, it was, uh, it was horrific. And so I just really went super shields up. Um, you know, some of it's about privacy. I'm a fat woman writing comics. So that's like a problem. It's like, it's a problem for people that I'm fat and ugly. It's a problem for them if I'm thin and pretty. It's like, you know, they just have problems. And I don't I don't care. I just want to be a writer. So leave me alone. So I kind of do this and I feel mixed about it. I think I miss out on a lot of really cool shit. And that bums me out. But it also yeah. gives me some peace of mind. And, you know, like a lot of times you hear about it. Like, I, I do think that people who are sort of uh, sort of tread water around my similar fame level where you're famous sort of in a niche way in a niche industry that doesn't really afford you any protection but does mean some guy can just look up your house on google maps like it's you know it's it's anxious it's anxiety inducing so i i do step back from it a little bit but you know i don't know because we're dumb hope springs eternal i like to think i'm gonna go um, I, you know, I, we won, I won an Eisner for Black Widow. I yeah. didn't get to go to that ceremony because it was COVID, but you know, if I ever get nominated for an Eisner again, I'd like to go. So, you know, I'd like to break down some of these walls, but if I'm honest, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how reasonable it is. It doesn't feel that much safer these days, you know, and what I see a lot of my colleagues, especially my female colleagues go through is, uh, really frustrating. <laughs> Yeah, it does seem to be in general, uh, females in any field get uh, much larger levels of harassment for you know, for whatever yeah. it is they're doing. Uh, the the craziest thing I saw in recent memory was when the second Last of Us game came out. Uh, oh. Laura Bailey got death threats to herself yep. and her family because the character she voiced did something they didn't like in the game. Oh. It's crazy, Psychotic. man. It's it's really upsetting. It's really upsetting how, you know, whatever. It's like, it's the thing I was saying before. It doesn't really feel good out there. It feels like everyone is tense. It feels like there's not enough money. There's not enough jobs. There's all this anxiety around all these things. Not Nobody has enough health care or mental health care. And like people are snapping and people really are. I mean, a friend of mine who's not a woman is getting it, it, some death threats so bad that the FBI is involved. Like, Holy. I mean, are you kidding me? Like, it's, it's, it's very upsetting. It's very upsetting to me when, even if you're angry with a writer and that's fine. Like, you know, I've been plenty angry at writers and artists and a million creators for things they've done or not done over my lifetime. And I'm sure I'm not done being annoyed with them. But when you're prioritizing fictional things on paper, I don't care how important they are to you over actual people's lives and like sense of mind. I, I mean, I, I'm sorry. Like, you know, we just talked a lot about how comics aren't superheroes, but a hell of a lot of them are. And I don't know what comics you guys are reading, but those are not superhero actions. Yeah. These are bad things. Yeah. Really yeah. Yeah. Appalling. You run into that on social media as well. You know, you oh, yeah. occasionally find a troll that comes up on our our account or our own personal accounts. And, you know, people are really uh, brave behind digital yeah. 
digital yeah. platforms, but Hell yeah. you know, I don't know. It's crazy. Um, it's hard. It's hard because I think, you know, to take it back to what I think we'd rather talk about is, you know, I just started writing pitches. I made a few connections, um, mostly through the podcast. Honestly, that was where I connected the most with other sort of reader writers and editors that, that like we would have a really good rapport. And so they were pretty open to, um, you know, sort of seeing a pitch from me or like Kelly Sue DeConnick threw my name at some editors like, Hey, you know, she's looking to break in and whatever. And that got me a few little offers or offers to pitch for like shorts and stuff like that. And, you know, you just start chipping away at it and that's how it went. Wow. I didn't ever go to a con. I mean, I went to one when I was 17, but I didn't ever go and network at a con or go to any of those like bar meetups or whatever. I didn't do any of that stuff. So I'm certainly a measure for you can do it without doing all of that stuff. Like I did it almost entirely from home. Um, I think until I got signed by Marvel Comics, I hadn't met in person, face to face, a single person in comics, except for Sophie Campbell, who she and I had become friends. And so when she came to town, once we met up for dinner or whatever, so like you can do it the way I did it. I think you can do it faster if you are more willing to like go out and shake hands and kiss babies and go to cons and do all that. But it can also be expensive and hard. So, you know, that's I, I think I'm a little bit of a sign for people who don't have maybe those opportunities like that it can be done. But, you know, you got to do everything else right. You got, you got to have nope. some really good ideas. You got to turn in your work on time. You got, you know, all the other stuff has got to work in order for people to take that chance on you. Yeah. Um, I always love hearing origin stories like that and finding how people, you know, first found their path, but then made that break into the profession. I mean, it, it blows my mind because, um, a lot, you know, we, we interviewed, um, artist travis mercer in our previous episode and you know it's a lot of hard work it's a lot of going against the grain when people are i mean i'm sure you probably in every step of the way had people saying no 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 but you had to keep going forward because that's where you knew your path had to be you yeah. know i love hearing that story yeah. um and you know the cream always rises to the top, you know, the talent and the hard work will always, you know, bring out the, the people that are wanting to do it and have I, to do it. I do say to people like some of this is luck, man. Some of it is luck and being in the right place at the right time mm -hmm. and all of that. But what you have to do is you have to do everything in your power so that you're ready when the luck hits or when the opportunity strikes. Like, yes, you should, you know, the more charming and likable you are, great. That's going to come in handy. Can you do it without being charming and likable? Yes, you absolutely can. Is it way, way harder? Yes. So work on your social skills, work on all of that stuff. And don't forget to write pages or draw pages. If you're an artist, like you just have to keep going. I do think that having an origin story like mine, where I can point to a moment where I realized I was on the path, the wrong path and like made an effort to reorient myself onto the correct path. I think that helps with the stuff that you come up against later because there's just this there's there's an ability to look back and go no I, they're not wrong i already did this i already had that moment where i had that crossroads and i was like oh shit <laughs> <laughs> everything i'm on the wrong road how far down this road have i gone i'm on the wrong road and so then i you know tried to back out of it and even once i got back on that road i still spent 10 years working in architecture and writing on the side and like you know i wrote this i wrote this graphic novel heart in a box that was the first thing that i pitched eventually um i wrote two novels i mean my novel uh the girl who would be king i wrote that as a novel because i desperately wanted to write a comic book and i didn't have any money so i couldn't pay any artists and i was like okay well superheroes are cool i know the rest of the world hasn't really figured this out yet because that's how old i am nobody there were no comic book movies yet like none of this was happening yet and i was like is it cool to do this as a novel like this dueling superhero 
villain, you know, and I was like, yeah, let's try it. Let's people, nobody's doing that. Well, people are fucking doing it now. It's everywhere. Yeah, right. That's where everything so, is coming from now. Yeah. So, so like, you know, I had plenty of, I mean, you know, you look at those Kickstarters and they were big successes and they helped me carve a path. They helped me build a lot of stuff. They made connections for me. They taught me a ton, but you know, even though those are successes, why was I on Kickstarter? I was on Kickstarter because I had failed to get picked up traditional publishing. Everything I gave them, it was always a little to this or not enough that, or, you know, it's like, well, we like that it's, we think it's YA, but it's not YA enough. Or we like that it's violent, but it's too violent. You know, it's like, it was always something. And I was just like, so spent so much time trying to like force my square shape into these round holes. And like, Finally, I was like, eh, we'll just do it on Kickstarter. Like, I got to get this career going. And so mm -hmm. I did it. And those were big successes there. And they helped, you know, keep the ball rolling to roll into what's next. But, you know, freelance writing is uh, it's a hard, weird journey where there's a lot of sort of new evolutions you have to, you know, go through. But it it is, in the end, I think it's good for comics that there are people that come into it from so many different backgrounds like you did, you know, uh, having gone through graphic design and then the, the, the architecture world, uh, Kian Tormi was a graphic designer before, uh, he started drawing comics, uh, but the episode before this, we had, uh, Mattson Tomlin on along with Lieberman and Mattson writes and directs movies. And now he's doing comics and, you know, we have John Ridley now, uh, you know, uh, I think he's an Oscar winner and now he's writing yeah. like Black Panther and Batman comics. And it's, <laughs> it's great for comics that we have people coming in from, uh, from different backgrounds. It's not just, everyone isn't just you know, one of us nerds that grew up reading comics and, you know, they have uh, life experiences and other things. Yeah, I think, I think you're right that it's actually a really beautiful thing about comics, but I do think that part of the reason it is that way is because comics are so unforgivingly brutal. Yeah. It's, you know, if you could just, if you could just make a great living doing this with a reasonable amount of hours, so many more people would do this and not escape to other things or people who came from other things and tried this would do this for longer because it's really beautiful. And especially for people who are writers, I feel like, you know, writers in films, it's like, I don't know. I, I haven't been through this, so I can't say it for sure. But as someone who has written some screenplays and has been given a thousand tons of advice about that industry and how it works and how it is and whatever, from someone yelling at me on the internet straight up to my manager, like from, from running the gamut of that, it's that the screenwriter has no power. You, if your only power is when you're selling the script and you're getting your money, but like you, unless you're someone who's engaged in that process with them because you're the writer director or something like that, it's like you're maybe never involved again after you get paid. But like on a comic, it feels more collaborative to me. I'm yeah. in it with the artist until the end. Like hopefully we're there together, you know, typically because artists jobs take so much longer writers tend to come in first and build first but in the ideal scenario you and your artists are there together at the very beginning and you're there together at the very end you know arguing over a a, a panel and a word balloon or a whatever you know and you're figuring it out together and i think that collaboration is what makes comics so much more special you know, um, even in television where writers have a lot more power than in film, it's not like it is in comics, you know, and that, and yet, and I loved writing prose, but prose is such a singular thing. And it's fun to like only have yourself to rely on and to think about it like that. But let me tell you what, there's no Christmas morning all the time when you get an inbox full of pages from a brilliant artist when you're writing a prose novel. So you got to find another thing to keep you going. Like, like I can't tell you how much it helps you get through, you know, script five or whatever, when you're seeing art come in for three and it's so mind blowingly cool and fun. And you're like, okay, this is why we're doing it. You know, yeah. helps you, helps you stay in it. Well, let's keep talking about that uh, kind of process with uh, the that collaborative effort because I want to talk about the cull. Uh, so I got to read the first issue of this uh, a while, like a, 
Image <laughs> sent it out a couple months ago, and was I was strange. immediately on board with this one. So I, I want to quote what uh, Image is talking about. So Image is describing this as something is killing the children horror vibes mixed with Goonies style adventure. And now, depending I mean... on how horror-y this goes, <laughs> this could be a bit of a departure from a lot of your usual work. Uh, what were the inspirations for this? Where did the cull come from? Well, Goonies is definitely one of the inspirations. Um, all our, it's a, it's a much more grown up Goonies though. That's the only reason I worry about that. Um, these are like 18 year old kids, not, yeah. you know, 13 and, or 12 or whatever. Troubled 18 year old kids. <laughs> <laughs> are my kids troubled i mean they are yeah. i guess but i think they're all a little bit exceptional so like we were answering an interview and they were like they're all sneaking out but the vibe doesn't seem like the and i'm like yeah these aren't your usual we're gonna get into shenanigans kids these are kids who are like we're going to shoot a short film like they have a lot of plans you know yeah. but uh, unfortunately uh cleo has the most plans and uh, that's a problem for everyone um because Cleo has some horrible things that happened to her and it's sort of changed her perspective on things. And so now we're, uh, we're in pretty deep. Yes. Goonies. I think they always want you to do comparables. I think something is killing the children is a good comparable for us for a few reasons, but honestly, I'm very bad at comparables. It's very hard mm -hmm. to do. It's like, it's so funny because when you're pitching, you know, it's so dangerous. People are like, oh, is that just like something is killing the children? And you're like, no, 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 it's, you know, it's so different. It's like, <laughs> it's this and it's that and it's this thing. And then once they're ready to promote it, they're like, so can we say it's like something is killing the children? And you're like, yeah, but yeah, but we, we tried so hard to make sure it was its own thing. And now you want to do that. But this is, this is marketing, right? You got to get it out there. You got to get the message out there. So I think adult Goonies is right. I think the horror vibes and kind of the tone is a little bit something is killing the children, which should help. Yeah. Um, we've definitely, we've got a big mystery. We've got a, some monsters, like literally on page two. So um, like we're going, yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, you know, so we're not messing around. We're a five issue miniseries. So, you know, you can't, you don't have time to just uh play around we're getting in <laughs> yeah. and to go back to what i was uh meaning about the, your kids being kind of troubled uh, some of it is just if you look at some of the details like uh this is i think this is page two or something here uh yeah if you look at her arm while she's writing you know drawing these little flags up you can see you know the the cut marks on her arm we've got another yeah. character who you'll see before she heads out is putting makeup over a black eye yeah so yeah they, they yeah. they're kids who uh have they, some things going on there are definitely things going on in their lives for sure and um and we did that very deliberately because that kind of stuff you know one of the beauties of working with mattia mattia de Ulias is the artist yes. and he does this digital he's the colorist too because he does this beautiful digital painting it's incredibly realistic and one of the benefits of working for him, working with him is that he, there's no concern that people are going to miss a detail. Like it's, it's like looking almost at a photograph. So, yeah. you know, if we want people to know it's 3.33 AM, I can tell him to make sure that's visible in the room and everyone will see it. So we were able to do a lot of stuff like that where, I was just very specific in the script about the kind of rooms they were in, the kind of house, how they were with their family, all these sort of details, the kind of clothes and everything. And so, yeah, there's a lot of clues. Are there clues about, you know, to answer like the riddle of the monster? No, but there are clues to sort of unlocking who the characters are and the kind of things that are going to be coming back by issue four and five that are going to play a role in sort of what's happening to everyone. So I would say those are the bigger clues to the real mystery, which is like the mystery of unlocking the characters and everything there, you know? Oh. So well, yeah, just the all... name itself kind of intrigues me because, you know, working through college, I worked construction and part of my job was to cull through the wood to find <laughs> the good straight <laughs> two by fours so you know what it means <laughs> right i've come i've come to realize quite a few people are not familiar with what it means to be cold right um, hmm. 
So yeah, so there's a selection process. There okay. is a selection process. That's an excellent way to phrase it. Robin, did you see after we get off, go back to the double page spread, the second one, uh, after they go through the cave and uh, tell me if you see it now. Nobody sees it the first time, so don't feel bad. And that we wanted it that way. We wanted it that way. But anyway, let me know. Nobody sees it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 it will, might... I will, uh, will address it uh, off after Because, <laughs> yeah, the, the book isn't there yet, so we don't want to spoil things. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, so I, so it, I won't say anything yet. Yeah, don't say anything live. Um, I mean, not that gives it away, but um, I would just be curious. Uh, we're sort of playing this game with people. And I'm like, yeah, did you see the thing? And they're like, what thing? And nobody's seen it so <laughs> far. So it's been fun. It's been fun. And Maddie That's and cool. I talked, we talked a lot about that. Like, is it not as powerful if if people are missing it? And I was like, I don't, I don't think that's true. I think I read a lot of comics. I think everyone who reads comics reads a lot of comics. And sometimes you're just going too fast, like me included. Like you just know you're you're we're programmed, right? Everything is fast, everything in this instant. And so we're programmed to just move as fast as we can through these things. And I'm not saying I expect people to slow down and you certainly don't have to, like you're not going to not understand the story if you don't go back and see what's on that double page spread, but it is a nice little treat. If you go back and you go, Oh shit. Okay. I see. I see what we're doing here. Like, it's just like a little, it's like having a little insider clue because you paid a little more attention when you were going through the pages. And when Maddie and I landed on it, doing it this way, I was like, I don't know, man, I think it's cool. I think it's cool because I feel like I could pick this issue up and not see it if it wasn't my book and come back to it five years later and see it and be like, oh, man, it was there. <laughs> see, I, I love that because, you know, there are certain books that we all love, certain stories that we all love that you can read it a hundred times and pull something new out of it every time. Yeah. So, yeah, you don't have to just, you know, show everything all at once i, I like yeah. i like the you know if you didn't tell me right there that there's a little easter egg you know who's to say i would not notice it the first time now i'm going to specifically yeah i look did for it, i did but, ruin it for you that's well, your punish that's your punishment <laughs> I, I, will, I will take that as long as i know and i know now that i really need to study these pages and i love that yeah. i i love looking through when I know a writer and an artist, every panel means something. Yes. That is well, very as, much what Maddie and I are doing for sure. Yeah. I mean, I as, can't, as far, I can't tell you every panel is yeah. like equally important, but yeah, it's, we're being very deliberate in the things we're doing for sure. Cool. As far as the, uh, the impact, if people miss the thing or not, just to, to give you an insight on that. If what you're talking about is what I think you are, then I did notice it the first time. But <gasps> I, I could, I could, I it, it it could be a different thing. I could be a dummy who thinks they're smart. So uh, I don't know. But mm, we'll we'll, we'll find out later. I doubt that, but I'm very impressed if you saw saw the first time. That's that's great. And I mean, I, I figured there would. I that it's not the thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, is Sarah? I I could private chat you here. We could do that. That's funny. Okay, oh, but then right. Gramps will see it. Never mind. Oh, yeah. That's all right. <laughs> anyway, this will intrigue people, if nothing else. They'll be like, all right, well, I got to know what stupid thing is on this double page spread. <laughs> 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 Have you ever seen that joke about, um, God, I think I saw it on Twitter a million years ago, but it's like, po you know, $6 for the antidote to the poison. Ten dollars I charge for the moist towelettes you need to use the poison or to clean your hands after the poison, and then I charge twenty dollars for the book that explains why I poisoned everyone. And I just thought that shit would work on me, man. I need to know what why <laughs> why did this happen? So um yeah, you never know. And as far as that uh, bit of marketing that we talked about with the comparison, you can't go wrong with comparing anything 
applicable to something that's killing the children. It's so popular right now. It is one of oh, my yeah. favorite comics. And but is there anyone that doesn't love Goonies? Uh, you know. Even, I mean, I don't, uh, I don't the, want, the, I don't want to meet them if they don't <laughs> like yeah, Goonies. <laughs> even, even, even the Bob's Burgers episode, the Goonies episode on that. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's funny that we're in a time now where you can see how many people, you know, in our age group who grew up watching the Goonies are now out there making things because you get these Goonies tribute things like the the Bob's Burgers episode a few years mm-hmm. ago. There was an episode of Goldberg's that was uh, a Goonies tribute. So yeah. It's, uh, yeah, cool seeing that, you know, how much more people who grew up at the same time we did, how much more they're doing than I have done <laughs> <laughs> out there making things. Yeah, but honestly, like, I just I'm just sort of excited. Like, I mean, I think you're a little bit talking about a thing my partner Adam and I were talking about recently, which is just that. Like it's not just that we've been watching a lot of really incredible television in the last weirdly, I would say, I would say it started for me last summer. I saw white Lotus season one and then season two, pretty close to each other. We saw Andor, which blew my mind. We saw severance, which blew my mind. Oh yeah, severance. We saw silo, which blew my mind, which I've read wool. And I had these huge expectations for it. And I was just like, every day like beating myself up like oh it's not gonna be that good just like just don't be upset about it it's a really great novel like blah 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 and then it was amazing <laughs> it was so good i couldn't believe it it's it it's rare for adaptations mind. to work well oh man i've i've really come around on adaptations a little bit because um good omens is one of my favorite yeah. books i've probably read it 20 times but that and the adaptation was great but i found myself really bored by it because it was so authentic to the book yeah that i was just like i would just rather read the book and that was one of the first times that ever happened to me which where i knew the source material and loved the source material so much and then i was worried about the adaptation and then they did everything right and i was sort of not fulfilled by it because and it was the first time i really realized that i am looking for something a change in the adaptation i yeah. am looking for you to really find those ways and i don't want to i don't want to shit on the good omen stuff especially because i'm very excited to see season two yeah, because I'm, that's I'm ma- that's material it. that's material yeah. i've never seen before or read before yeah, so new stuff so the fact that it it could be so authentic to one a book i totally loved and now I sort of get a spiritual successor to it through the TV show is exciting. So I'm not trying to shit on it. I, I'm just trying to say that it was the, it was a realization for me that I am looking for an adaptation to do something different because I want them to look for those avenues in which changing to a new medium can do something different with the material. Yeah, wh- Otherwise, wh- what do I want? Right. Otherwise I've already seen it. You know what I mean? But it truly did not happen for me until good omens. And I couldn't figure out why I was frustrated by it. And then I was like, Oh, this is it. It's a secret third thing over here that I didn't even realize because, you know, we just spend most of our life being irritated that these adaptations aren't good. Like the source material. Where is Tom Bombadil? Yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So anyway, so that was a big, that was a big moment for me. Um, But yeah, we've watched all. And I said to Adam, I said, well, I don't want to say that like our generation is, well, we're better. That's why I'm seeing the golden age of television. It's not that, but it is that it makes sense that some of these ideas feel so right to us because they are being created by a lot of our peers. Like a lot of people that are the same age that have the same touchstones, they're finally being in positions of power where they're not just working on a show, they're creating a show they're developing the ideas about the show and so of course some of this stuff is really hitting hard for us now as these people really sort of blossom and it's been it's been cool man it's cool to see other people have known all these years that the goonies is the greatest you know it's like and 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 then the generation that will spawn from this one like and imagine what inspirations will come from the shows that we're watching now in this time where TV has made this change from being 26 episode seasons to, Mm -hmm. you know, give 
people a thing to watch once a week for 30 minutes to now it it is becoming uh, a, a 10 or 13 episode season that is about telling a story and mm -hmm. the people that that has brought to it like uh yeah. You know, well, my, my favorite thing, like I've loved The Last of Us for 10 years and I've played it so many times I could tell people the story just from memory. Mm -hmm. And then the the series that did what we talked about took that and elevated it. You know, there were surprises yeah. for people who knew it well mm -hmm. and they were all done really well. Yeah, I'm not really I haven't played last. I try not to play games because I don't get my work done if I do that. Yeah. So I try not to get too involved <laughs> in video games, um, which has not worked with Marvel Snap, by the way. Let's not talk about that. Um, but uh, yeah, I try not to get too involved. But it, I heard that a lot. I heard similar sentiment to that a lot that um, that it really um, respected the original material and like really brought it, but that there was a lot of, there were a lot of surprises and, and, and sort of smart innovations within it. Yeah. And uh, that, that comes from, you know, the, the people involved like uh, Craig Mazin, he did uh, Chernobyl. Yeah. He's great. And uh, you know, he has loved last of us since it came out too. And <laughs> that was why he wanted to, uh, to make this. And yeah, the, it's the people that are involved in making the things. And now we'll have to look forward to the people who are inspired by these shows and these comics uh, making things in the future. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be interesting. I mean, yeah. for as much of it as I get to see. <laughs> did, did you uh, did you watch Yellow Jackets? We loved it. Yeah, we yeah, loved Yellow it. Jackets. I am. Um, I was really struggling at one point because I don't know where you guys fall on this. Um, but it became clear to me that like a lot of the fans wanted like a literal supernatural thing and like, like a creature to like come up out of the ground or whatever and be <laughs> controlling them or something. Like it became clear to me that a lot of people wanted like a crazy supernatural thing. And Adam and I were at home watching it going, this trauma is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, like these women are what they did to survive and how that there's sort of not anything wrong with it. It's sort of like a, a most natural thing in the world, but it's also like touching something like very primitive and wild that we don't touch. And like, how on earth do you go integrate yourself back into the world, knowing what you've done and who you are and man i i was i was so into those aspects of it and so was adam and we were very worried that like we were on the losing side of that and like some <laughs> creature was gonna like crawl up out of a well or something all of a sudden and i was very relieved as i was seeing season two sort of I mean, I'm not saying they can't still do that if they wanted. I guess they oh, could, sure. but it was very much pushing toward my version of the show, which I think is so important and so unusual and rare, especially to see women when we get to see them young and then also letting them be like normal women of a certain age. Like, it, God, it's so rare. And then to cast it with those incredible actresses, the it's just been like a smorgasbord of wins. It's like, yeah, just win, win, win. I love it. Yeah. All these, uh, you know, women, well, I guess half of them, maybe you could describe as, you know, sort of affluent and successful, but they're, sort of wearing these masks yeah and pretending totally. that they aren't secretly dead inside yeah <laughs> there's a you know the episode where they go in season two where they go to the compound and they're yeah. all have to go off on their jobs and mm -hmm. you know it's supposed to be like it's designed to be like therapy but like oh we're sort of hiding it we're like pretending it's not therapy by like hey go gather these sticks kind of like when you would go call that wood so, uh, you know, they, they, they do that. And I was like, I said to my partner, it was the very beginning of the episode. I was like, the Melanie Linsky character is so incredible and she's so tough. She's so hard edged and not soft. And I was like, they are not going to be able to get a reasonable breakthrough with her in this episode. Like, I don't see how it's possible. 20 minutes later, I'm in tears <laughs> apologizing <laughs> to the episode for doubting because they it. Gave her a lamb. Because they gave that worked so well. Between yeah. the script and what she was able to bring to it, I was blown away. It was incredible. Yeah. It was incredible. Truly great stuff. Truly great writing. Truly, truly great execution. 
um, very cool stuff. And uh, I want to talk also about uh, another group of uh, largely traumatized women. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the next comic uh, the that, that, that you're bringing up is uh, I do Birds love of trauma Prey. And I do love women. <laughs> uh, of them. So yes. this is, uh, aside from the Harley Black, White, and Redder uh, issue that you did a story in recently, I believe this is your first DC project. It is. It's my first DC so project. How did they finally get you over there? My contract ran out. <laughs> there you go. That'll do it. We've been, yep. We've been talking for a while. Um, and every year it was sort of like, well, I'm still exclusive. Maybe we talk next year. And then uh, Marvel didn't re-sign me. So we started talking. And uh, it was, um, you know, it's been really exciting. It's, it's hard to make that leap over, like both tying stuff up where you were, you know, especially ending a really long run like I was on. Um, it's a little more emotional baggage than I sort of would have thought like to negotiate and then starting something new somewhere else where, I mean, certainly I've read tons of DC comics in my life, but having been immersed in Marvel for the last, you know, seven or eight years, uh, I've kept up with some stuff, but you know, you feel way out of your depth when you've been playing for the other team for a while. And so there's a lot of going back and reading a lot of stuff and checking out, like not just like bo re-boning up or boning up on characters you maybe don't know as well as you should, but there's also just trying to read the current books and like get a feel for what they're trying to do and what they're interested in. And like, you know, trying to slot your stuff into that as you think it can fit. Um, you know, ideally for someone like me, I like to sort of slot into what is going on and then like do something really cool within it hopefully that like makes people pay attention so we'll see i so think i have a great a, team for it yeah the, for we're, sure we're seeing it right here uh, uh how did you piece together this team and why why was this the team uh so the mission is like a very personal specific thing for canary and she it's a big it's a big it's going to be a big fight like she needs she needs a tank so that sort of explains why she goes for this sort of wild and in some ways like crazy overpowered team. I mean, Barda, Zealot, Cass Kane, and, and, you know, Harley, because she's so flexible, she's sort of like that too, even if you wouldn't call her like a, like a super powered, whatever. Right. Um, so I just sort of, but it was also about just reaching for my favorite stuff. I mean, you know, I, I was like, well, if I'm going to try to write Birds of Prey, I'm just going to reach for everything I want and they can <laughs> tell me no or they can let me have it. And they just kept saying yes. So I kept grabbing things. <laughs> and, and put Barda in everything. <laughs> I love her. I love her so much. I hope people like my take on her. Um, I don't know. My uh, editor, Ben Abernathy, I don't know if he likes her or maybe he's just like on the fence with her or maybe he just hasn't read enough to have an opinion but he said on my first scrap he goes I really love the way you write Barda I was like oh thank god like you don't realize like you know it's uh I talked to someone I talked to they did an interview just yesterday with two guys who'd read the first issue and of these poor guys because they're the first people I've gotten to talk to outside of the circle who've read it and so I was like I was jumping all over them like <laughs> wasn't their interview anymore i was like i'm sorry i'm sorry it's just like <laughs> when you first finally get that outsider look at you know at the thing it's like you know yeah i'm i'm ravenous to know what people think like it's so hard to wait so long and there's now, so much writing on it you know you, you mentioned that. something there about your editor now i always you know because i'm kind of an outsider more of a fan do editors help you as a writer you know find the voice for certain characters do they give you feedback like no i think they would respond this way or do they just let you find your own voice with some I, characters i think i think for the most part they let you find your own voice i think it's certainly something where writers can be pretty sensitive about that i would su suspect i know i would be so probably when they try to get someone to adjust they probably are pretty careful about it and wear kid gloves like finding clever ways to say it like does she really say y'all i don't know about that like <laughs> um but i will say that you know because i'm me and i don't know if that means i'm anxious 
and lack confidence, or if it means I'm incredibly conscientious, pick your, pick your horse. Um, I, when I was working on the Harley Quinn story with Andrea Shea, who is also an incredible editor, uh, I, I said to her, I was like, listen, this is my first time writing Harley Quinn. So here's how I sort of see the voice. And, you know, I'd already pitched the story to her and she'd said, yes. So we were already working on it, but I was like, if you want to, I'm open to, com I specifically said to her, I'm open to comments about if you think I'm not getting the voice right. Like, I think I'm going to tweak it. This isn't final, final, but like, here's where I'm settling in. And like, if you see problems and like, that was a really good instance. It's why I tell this story where she was like, I think you're really close. She was like, I would say more yes instead of yeses or yours, like Y-E-R, like her slang, like she does that a little more. And I was like, oh, that's a really good note. And so I put like a few of those in where they really worked and it totally helped. It totally helped smooth out the voice. So, you know, I feel like voice is one of my strong suits. Um, part of that is because I think I'm pretty good with dialogue. Part of that is because I do a lot of reading and prep. I like to be well prepared. Um, so I don't worry about voice a lot, but it was one of my big concerns in moving over to DC because I know even for the characters that I'm super boned up on, there are still much bigger blind spots than there usually are with Marvel. So yeah, I want help, but I think that's probably a writer editor, like it probably depends just in every scenario. Like even with Ben, he hasn't really been he hasn't said anything about like getting Harley's voice right. Now that's probably because I already onboarded the things I had done with Andrea. And so like, we'd already, I'd already sort of addressed that, but like, you know, he hasn't noted that anybody else's voice felt off or something, but Oh, here's a good example. Sorry. This is too many stories. Um, no, there's, a, there, <laughs> there's a, there's a scene, there's a section in. So cast Cassandra Kane is one of my favorite characters in all of comics. And, you know, one of the things that's hard to get right about Cass, I think, for people, especially with new writers, because as new writers, we always try to overwrite. You try to do too much because you think that's the answer. And Cass is a really laconic character. She doesn't speak a lot. She's a woman of action. So you really have to have the real estate and you have to create those moments to give her those cool moments because she's probably not going to deliver a rousing speech, you know? So um, I had this idea for issue one, but I didn't, but it required Cass narrating the scene and for like three or four pages and it felt so wrong. And I, and I turned in the script to Ben and I was like, this Cass thing, it's not working. And like, as, as a super fan of hers, I can't get this right. And he was like, well, let me look at it. And then by the time he'd looked at it, I'd had an idea. I was like, okay, I know how to fix it, but you have to give me two or three more pages. And he was like, all right, you have to tell me the idea. <laughs> or I'll give you two or three more pages. And so I explained how I wanted to get around having her narrate the scene, but it required a thing on the back end to like get us out of it, you know, without, if you don't have that crutch of narration, we had to have a different way to get out of it. So I won't spoil it for you guys because I think it's pretty cool to read organically, but I did convince him. And that's why the issue is 25 pages, but like, that's a great example of the first script didn't have Cass's voice, right? Because it was doing too much because we were writing too many pages of her narrating a thing, which is not what Cass Kane does. And so, you know, we could have just cut the scene and done something different if he hadn't been willing to give you the pages. Like it never would have gone to print the way it was on the first draft when we were still trying to figure that scene out. But I am really glad that that he and DC were willing to go to bat for the other pages because I think it was the best possible scenario and it turned into a cool thing. And it and it ends up having the effect like with the guys I talked to yesterday where it felt like a tiny little mini story within the larger story. So that's always fun. Very cool. Now, Barda in particular, I think, has been in some really cool books just in the last few years. Uh, is there anything uh, in particular that have you read any of the recent stuff to uh, to, to get into uh, that headspace? Well, I guess I only for sure know you're talking about Mr. Miracle, which I love. Yeah. Yes, I yeah. love yeah, it. That was so really good. good. So good. And uh, I mean, 
I don't think our take is exactly the same just because, mm. you know, they're a little different. What Tom's doing oh, yeah, there yeah. is a little yeah, different. A different but but I wouldn't say you wouldn't recognize her. It's similar. The sort of simple short answer. She just sort of says whatever's on her mind. She doesn't really care what other th people think. Like, yeah, that's that vibe. <laughs> and uh, I, I really liked her too in the other Tom uh, doing her in uh, Deceased uh, War of the Undead Gods. That was a, a completely different take. You know what? I don't know if I've read that one. I've read a bunch of the Deceased, but not all of them. And I have to say, I've read a lot of Tom stuff. I feel like I would remember her Barda, his Barda. I might have to seek that out. Yeah. So the throughout Deceased, there are three main chapters of it. Uh, and uh, War of the Undead Gods is the the third and final main chapter, but uh, yeah, she's uh, she and Scott are uh, a big part of that one, and it's it's a, a really cool and really different uh, version of both of them. Then in Tom's very uh, obviously very different story. Yeah, I'm gonna go. Uh, you know what? I have read some of this. I recognize some of it. I'm gonna go look that up when we get off. And I'm going to keep looking for this Birds of Prey issue. I'm looking. I don't see a PDF of it yet, so I don't know why I don't have that yet. Oh no, you probably don't, because the funny thing was when I was talking to those guys and I was getting so excited, and then it came out during the conversation that they didn't have colors, and I was like, honestly, I'm relieved because I don't have colors, and I was wondering why yeah. you guys had it before <laughs> I did, <laughs> or the final colors at least. That yeah. Is. So, so yeah, so that PDF hasn't gone out yet. If they're still waiting on colors, I'm sure. Uh, I think that it was just our first sort of PR bit we were doing. So they wanted to give these guys a chance. Cool, um, cool. But they really liked it. So that's good. <laughs> and now uh, I wanted to just touch back, uh, get kind of a, a broad strokes thing on the two books that we talked about a lot here. So if people are thinking about checking out the call what can they expect as a as a story diving into that one i think it's a it's an adventure story with sci-fi fantasy stuff in it and horror stuff also um it's all it's always very hard for me to to put myself my stuff under a certain genre because i really like to mash up genres you know yeah. black cloak is detective fiction but it's yeah. also sci-fi but yeah. it has mermaids in it it's fantasy so i, yeah, I like very, very fantastic I, I, I like yeah i like to blend these things together and to get weird hybrids those are sort of my favorite things yeah something that uh, probably the best part of working in a comic shop is being able to introduce people to the fact that comics aren't just superheroes you know it's not just batman and the x-men and spider-man uh you know fighting yes. bad guys and stuff you know you show them that there's horror and westerns and mystery and you know whatever department of truth yeah. is and yeah. <laughs> it's amazing it, it really is amazing um you know certainly i feel like once you really get into comics and fall in love with it it's sort of impossible not to understand the difference between medium and genre because there are so many cool genres but that is such a misnomer that people don't understand even my mother <laughs> she did the comics project with me when i did it and i sent her you know i sent her a graphic novel i didn't send her superheroes she hated superheroes <laughs> she was so sick of them from when i was reading them when i was a teenager that of course i wasn't going to send her superheroes but so what happened was when it was time to talk about it she was like well i don't understand how it's a comic and i was like what do you mean you just read it and she's like yeah but how's it a comic and i'm like what do you mean you just read it it's in your hands like and it, after you know a couple minutes of trying to suss out what she was trying to say it became clear she didn't she just fundamentally didn't understand that there were different genres and so she took comics to mean superheroes and i think it's a problem a lot of people have it seems crazy to us because we're in it and we see how much stuff there is but yeah i mean if the signal to noise ratio is incredible for for people who aren't like in the hobby i think and you know what really grinds my gears is these people that come into it you know in recent years where it has become kind of cool and the, they will call them graphic novels to avoid saying that they read comics. It's a fucking yeah, comic. <laughs> I don't know. My, my, my partner, that really bothers him, too. I guess I don't care. 
just read yeah. the book just read the book <laughs> support the book tell other people to read the book and please pay for it as opposed to uh stealing it like like that's i feel yeah. like that's the best i can do but i can understand you you guys have the benefit of getting to be in the shop and deal with the customer like that and also the downside of that i get to be sort of protected from that if i want right um yeah so it's we have we have slightly different demons we have to feed i guess <laughs> but there you know at least there are there's been what for one there's a change lately in the demographics uh there are at, at my shop anyway we see a lot more young people now uh, not only young people in general but specifically young females buying comics mm -hmm. uh and the university here in town there's a professor there who does a comic book course and it's not just he doesn't just stick to old stuff which is my favorite thing about it so what he does mm -hmm. is everyone in the class is required to go to you know, one of the local shops oh, i love that open yeah they have to open a file and they have to collect at least one comic that comes out monthly for the duration of the class i love and, that that's yeah, so cool. great and that's they can so pick great. whatever they want for it but then there is also required reading for the class so each year it'll be you know watchmen yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know things like that but then he what i love is that he doesn't just stay with old stuff uh i think maybe two years ago he added actually maybe it was just last year he added the autumnal to hmm. the required reading uh christian's uh book Wow, so, that's yeah, very it's, cool. It, it's awesome that uh, he keeps uh, contemporary with it. I mean, listen, you can already tell he's keeping contemporary by literally asking people to go to a comic, to go into a comic shop, to like have that experience, and then to keep going back in it to follow and track the way a story is told. I think that's yeah. awesome. I yeah. mean, that should be. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Scad. I'm about to blow you up, but. <laughs> uh, none of my professors ever asked me to do that, and they 100% should have, especially at fucking SCAD. Yeah. Uh, sorry, that's the Savannah College of Art and Design, which is a sort of famous art school, just for people who might be listening. I'm sure you guys know, but <clears throat> not everyone knows. It's a sort of famous art school in uh, Savannah, Georgia, and um, it's one of the only schools where you can get a degree in sequential art, so it's sort of famous in that respect. Mm -hmm. Uh, people who like a lot of these things and like to combine them together um, seem to be less sensitive to, I, I feel like someone who doesn't like horror it, sees something and then goes, Oh, that's horror because that's scary to them. Or that is not something they're into. And the same thing. It's like, if someone doesn't like swords and sorcery, they're like, Oh, that's fantasy, you know? So like, I, I almost feel like the genre thing like just makes it easier for people to dismiss things. Maybe that's why I like to jam them together to like make it harder <laughs> to like write it off. I don't know. Um, so yeah, I think, I mean the Goonies thing, think Goonies grown up, but then add when they go to their rock, uh, things, things go very, very bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> um, I will say for people who are afraid to get in on a mini series, I think the last issue has an incredible ending. It's a horror ending, so it definitely could continue on. Like if we're successful and people love it, like we could do more. But it also will be like a devastating holy shit this is over now like you know maybe that will be the last issue we'll see um but i think it's uh like most horror sci-fi stuff it's got a pretty um intense uh sort of status change for the world for the characters by the end which i guess is obvious when you see that double page spread yeah <laughs> things aren't yeah. things aren't going to be completely normal after that happens <laughs> Um, it's, uh, but it's really about, I don't know. I, I have trouble pitching it. Cause it's like, it's a story about trauma. It's about how people process their trauma. It's about what makes people weak and what makes people strong and how they push through those things, why they do it, you know, what they'll fight for. Um, you know, it's just simple stuff. <laughs> and then, uh, what are we signing up for in birds of prey? Well, the first arc is called Megadeth, so there's yes. that. 
Um, <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's uh, mega death, but keep it fun. It's, um, it's, it's, uh, I've, I struggle to talk about this because it's a very intense team who's on a very serious mission, but it's still got jokes. It's still got lots of taking axes to golems and, um, you know, uh, making John Constantine help you with stuff and, uh, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you've got Constantine in it, then, yeah, Con that's, a, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> Constantine is an issue, too. Um, Arrow is in, Green Arrow is in issue three um, and issue one. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else that's not spoilery, but everything else is spoilers, I swear to God. Um, but, yeah, it's a really personal mission. Um, for people who are worried about Barbara not being there, yes, she's not there. I apologize. Um, also, they'll be discussing her literally on page one. So at least you'll know and understand the context and it'll all make more sense. And, you know, hopefully you'll like what you read after that and you'll stay on board with us, you know? Super. And just to reiterate, so... Uh, Birds of Prey it, number one is September 5th. The Cull number one is August 16th. And now I think it is time that we subject you to a lightning round before we let you get out. Oh, again. oh my God. Can I tell you one more thing? I don't know if either of you have been reading Black Cloak. Maybe Robin, you said mm -hmm. you were maybe. Yeah. So we are doing a second arc of Black Cloak. Nice. Um, it hasn't really been officially announced. I mentioned it on another podcast. I'll probably write about it on the Substack this week. But I hope that will start up in December. So, oh, cool. and we're just gonna roll right out into issue seven. So we're not gonna do a rebrand. So, fingers awesome. crossed. <laughs> Very good news. Thanks. All right, lightning round. Bring it. What What's your favorite Rage Against the Machine song? Ooh. I mean, I think it's Killing in the Name. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that just that's the whole lightning round. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, 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 drop. Should be. It, it should be. <laughs> oh what, man. Now what what machine were they raging against? I Next mean, the, the man is the only machine. <laughs> yeah. Hate to say uh, it. The it's, Terminator. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely Skynet. the man. It's definitely the man. The man. Um, you said you're from Portland. What is your favorite restaurant to go to Portland and what kind of cuisine is that? Well, I'm not from Portland, but I live in Portland. You live in Portland. Um, so maybe it's Porque No, which is a very famous Mexican joint here that people love. Okay. But really, this the real answer is Olympia Provisions, which is I get a, I get like eggs Benedict there. So it's like a butcher and, you know, like a it's like a meat shop meats uh artisanal meat whatever i don't know you know people who know about meat which is not me uh Olympia, barbecue then yeah but it's not i mean they do but they do do like sausage and ham and like the whole thing mm -hmm. which isn't really my vibe but i love that place i i and they've got like a very cool Portlandy vibe and it was one of the first places i ever came here they've of course gotten rid of my favorite sandwich the, the assholes but uh other than that it's a great it's a great place so pork that was the name or... of the sandwich <laughs> yeah, the no, assholes. It, was, it was called it was called the sweetheart ham and it was oh, adorable okay. it was adorable and i'm so sad Gra Gra Graham has also done a lot of culling of barbecued meat so this is a good subject <laughs> I was about to say, wow what's in that sandwich <laughs> that <was> delicious <laughs> um wow um do you know what, what's your favorite uh, I, dad joke Oh, 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 God, my favorite dad joke. I feel like I wrote a lot of them for Carol Danvers over the last year, but <laughs> year or two, but one. now I, I can't, I don't know if I know any. I've got a new jokes. one if you want to hear it. I'd like to hear it. What concert will only cost you 45 cents? When you go see 50 Cent with Nickelback. Home. 
That is a terrible, perfect dad joke. You nailed it. You nailed it. You nailed All it. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I like to ask this one. Uh, what is the best piece of advice you've ever been given and who gave it to you? I feel like most of the really good advice I've gotten is not publishable. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, 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 uh, you, uh, I, I don't know. Is it uh, under over, you overestimate our uh, <laughs> our standards? <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. I know I've gotten some really great advice. None of it is coming. Oh, here's this is a little bit of a cheat, but it's true. So one of my favorite books is Ernest Hemingway's A Movable Feast, which sounds much fancier and like I really think I'm special, but it's just a book about writing, really. And he gives a bit of advice that writers everywhere still use today. I saw it just the other day and they actually credited it to him, which is never stop writing at a good stopping place always stop writing at a bad stopping place when you're in the middle of the flow when you know exactly where that paragraph that sentence that chapter that scene is going you're excited about it like that's the best time to stop because starting is the hardest part so make it easier oh, uh, i found smart. it to be very very true and it's also incredibly hard to follow because that's not when you want to stop you want to stop when it gets hard because then you're like oh it's time for a break it got hard no, wrong, wrong instinct. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> um, what's your favorite snack when you're in the flow of writing? I don't really, it's not really convenient to snack when you're in the flow. Oh, you don't have like a little bowl of Skittles or no, because then... or anything? Yeah, I mean, anything that is going to get on your hands, like I don't want on the laptop. But I will say I'm very fussy about like having coffee or whatever. Like there's almost something sort of ritualistic about the coffee or a chai tea or something like the, having the coffee cup or like the takeaway mug. Like it's a very weird thing that a lot of people who talk about coffee talk about, but I don't really have anyone explain why why it feels good why it brings comfort i don't really understand what it's about but i would say that for me is more of a thing than than food okay. um i often forget to eat for a really long time and then and then feel sick and make horrible mistakes like a like a child <laughs> <laughs> oh i forgot to eat all day let me eat this block of cheese that seems wise <laughs> no these are bad choices anyway <laughs> Do you have a? Do you have any pets? We, I do. We have two cats, um, Monarch, uh, the Monarch, and Clive Warren. They are adorable, perfect animals who uh, are amazing, and I would die for. They're also a huge pain in the ass. <laughs> we have adopted some stray cats. Um, oh. One, one in particular, my boyfriend has adopted. <sighs> he's called pushy and um we can't really bring him in the house because my cats are little our cats are little divas who've never been outside and who have their brothers they have this bonded perfect relationship we can't bring this outdoor stray that we're taking care of inside he's gonna just destroy them and destroy the house but it like bums us out so it's now, been like a weird thing we're doing. You said your cat is named Clive Warren. That's a very specific name. It is. Go into that. <laughs> I I will because it should be a great story, but I've never figured out how to tell it the right way. So the monarch <laughs> is named after um, uh, <laughs> the monarch from Venture Brothers. And Cl Clive is named after... So Ricky Gervais had a podcast mm -hmm. for a while. Do you guys know this? Mm -hmm. So one of, and, and for a while that podcast, they did an animated thing, which yeah, is probably where we saw yeah. it on HBO. So Yeah. So that's the one that he did with Stephen Merchant and yes. Carl Pilkington. Yes. So Carl Pilkington, uh, the round headed buffoon, Carl Pilkington, yeah. <laughs> he talked about, that he saw a terrible movie with his wife or girlfriend or whatever. And he's like, I 
they, I don't know what they're thinking, these movies they make. And they're like, okay, so you pitch us the movie. And he pitched the most insane, stupidest movie you've ever heard of. And then when he was casting it, he said he wanted Rebecca De Mornay. Now, no offense to Re Rebecca De Mornay, who's a fine actress, but like, was she the hot actress on everyone's mind in whatever, five years ago when I watched this uh, thing? No. Um, and then he wanted Clive Warren who of course isn't a fucking person. He meant Clive <laughs> Owen. He can't even get this right. And so, yeah, that's our cat's name. And if you guys can figure out a way to tell that somewhat charming, weird, specific story that's better, please let me know because I've never figured it out. <laughs> it's it's the, just the too easy, weird. It's so weird, you know? The easiest way to sum it up might just be tell people Carl Pilkington. <laughs> Well, see, that kind of circles back to the story about the poison, because now I wanted to know the why. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Most cats don't have two names like that, so okay. Yeah, no, he's um, he's special. Um, <laughs> we we, I don't know. We, it's one of those things where sometimes you realize you're really just trying to entertain yourself, right? <laughs> like. Like that's my partner and I thinking we're very funny, you know, oh, 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 little inside jokes for us. Meanwhile, Clive's like, man, I got to live with this name. <laughs> Sorry, oh, man. At, at, at least, yeah, at least we didn't name you Riblet, which was on the table. So be Riblet. excited. Be excited about Clive. You weren't named after food. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to ask one other thing here. So we talked about uh, uh, TV. I want to get into comics. If uh, if you could tell people one comic to read if they haven't read it, what would that be? Oh man, I mean, it's yeah, we put you on the spot for shit. It's te <laughs> it's tempting to say Saga because I just think it's such a universal. I mean, you guys work at a comic shop; yeah, you've seen. I mean, and, it's and it's back now. Yeah, well, and it has something for everyone and it's really sort of long ranging. I feel like it's, yeah, I just, to me, saga is very much like when I look at myself and go, Oh, maybe combining all these genres is shooting myself in the foot. I look at saga and I go, that does it so well. Like, and it's very successful. So clearly if you can nail it, like people are into it, but you know, it's hard to nail it. Um, I also think, um, uh, James Tynan's, uh, something is killing the children is one of my favorite comics that's out right now. Yes. That's coming out right now Me as it, another one of my favorites is his, um, excuse me, his, um, uh, the house on the lake. I love it. Um, nice house on the lake. Sorry. Um, I also, one of my favorite comics to recommend to people is, uh, Matthew Rosenberg's four kids walk into a bank. I think that book is brilliant throughout, but I think it has an ending that is a kind of ending nobody has the balls to do these days. And I just have a lot of respect and for it. Um, it's like the right story, even if you're afraid to tell it or it's hard, you know? Um, so those are some of the books I recommend. I think, um, you know, it really depends on what somebody is looking for. I, I tend to tailor my stuff, you know? Yeah somebody yeah. somebody who wants bitch planet and will be like literally radicalized by it and you know be so excited like that person is maybe not interested in saga and the saga person maybe isn't interested in bitch planet but right but there's just so much out there to choose from yeah and if you like things like uh four kids and and rosenberg stuff uh definitely uh look at uh, what's the what's the furthest place from here yes uh, from him yes. and tyler boss yes that's very really good, good too. very good i think you see ads for it in i think i think it's in both black cloak that comes out this month and call i think um oh, cool. yeah we're big fans we're big fans over here um, I also think not to leave out my friend Ed Brisson. He's got a t new title, um, "The Sins of the Salt and Sea." That's very cool. Um, that's from uh... shit. Is that AW a AWA? I forget. I get them all confused now. You guys probably know better than I do. Yeah. 
I think I've got it here. I can probably answer that. Uh, Sultan, where did I just see it? It's making a liar of me. I'm not going to find it. Okay. I without without okay. taking way too long. Oh, no, it's okay. Yeah, but it anyway. it sounds. I I think you're actually right about it being AWA though. Yeah, I'm yeah. There pretty, it is. I, I do yeah, see yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. One of five. Uh, AWA. But yeah, I also but, have to say, like, if I was if if I was giving something to someone in mainstream comics right now too. Did you guys read Spirit World? Alyssa Wong's Spirit World. That's some of the best introduction of new characters I've seen at Big Two superhero stuff for a long time. I think it's incredibly smart that Xanthi is an incredible character right out of the gate and like pairing them with Constantine and Cass Kane in a sort of spirit, sort of supernatural story. It's, it's very <laughs> smart. I really like it. Yeah. And it's a, a cool uh, sort of movement uh, within DC, letting yeah. that happen, having the bringing these characters on. Uh, I believe that was uh, Jessica Chen's initiative yeah. uh, to do that. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to lose her now. I'm, I'm yeah, uh, yeah. She's she, going. She's what, going to. Is she going to like TV and movies or something? Or? I don't know. I don't. It's. I don't know where it is, but it's a loss. Whatever it is. I mean, I'm yeah. sure it'll be a gain for wherever she goes. But for us, it's a huge yeah. loss. I'm particularly mad at myself because we were really trying to work on something over the last couple of years, and it just didn't happen. And now, who knows? I might never get a chance. My loss. Well. Maybe maybe she'll come back. Yeah, maybe. We can hope. She'll be like, I had too much money in those other industries. I wanted to come back and humble myself. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's exactly what will happen. <laughs> anyway. Can well, we plug your website and how people yeah. can check sure. out your work? Sure. With social media so broken and nightmarish, uh, really the best thing to do right now is go to the Substack. Um, it's 1979semifinalist.substack.com. And um, you can sign up for a free newsletter there just to make sure we don't lose track of each other. Um, I'm pretty low key on the newsletters unless it's like, you know, a promotion of something and then maybe you get a few more than you want. But and then um, we'll be turning on the paid stuff again soon, actually, in August. And so there will be a lot of fun new content in addition to just sort of the free newsletter. But if you don't have the bandwidth for paid content, that's okay. The free is just a good way to keep in touch, especially with everything going on. I am on Blue Sky and Instagram and stuff, but, you know, it's like, look for me under Kelly Thompson and you'll probably find me. But the best way is... The best way is something we can control that is uh, not going to be taken away by a child on a whim. <laughs> Good times. And I, I, I wanted to ask for a while the the name, the 1979 <laughs> semifinalist. It's, it's your name everywhere. It is. It is. Um, when your name is boring like Kelly Thompson, everyone gets to social media before you do. And you have to uh, think about some branding to do. So... Uh, 1979 semifinals originally comes from it's a song from a jazz trio band called the bad plus uh, that I discovered when I was fairly young living in Los Angeles and I'm a huge huge fan of them and I even went and asked them if they would mind if I used this and they were cool with it Little did they know how famous I was going to become. No. Um, <laughs> Joke's on them. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Um, so, but what I think it is, because you don't just do something like that for your whole branding of your identity, unless it's more than just a song. Um, I use it as just like a keep trying. Keep trying. We're all semifinalists, right? Like you're semifinalists until you're not. Like just keep going. Keep, keep pushing. Just keep swimming. Yeah. Keep calling. There you <laughs> yeah. go. Yeah. Keep calling uh, <laughs> people right out of your way. It's, uh, it's great. Great, great situation. <laughs> so the call is coming. Birds yes. of Prey is coming. Check them both out. And if you haven't, Black Cloak, check yes. it all out. And yes. you've got lots of other stuff. to. And for anyone just listening to the audio version of this, I just want to point out that... Uh, Kelly's avatar is Jeff the shark. That is yeah. <laughs> probably the only wholesome thing that has ever happened on this show. <laughs> oh, and there will be a new Jeff print 
print Jeff in shops in October. So, and uh, when are we getting the venomized, carnageized Jeff that's... just slaughtering everyone? <laughs> <laughs> no, he just wants to play fetch in the park, man. He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to hurt until nobody until he gets a symbiote on him. <laughs> no, that's we did it in that ve extreme venomverse. Yeah, that's that's your, what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's still, he's, he's still wanted to just go to the park. This yeah. is my answer, and I'm sticking to it. Miss, missed opportunity. <laughs> oh come on, five pages uh, is shorter than you think. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. That's the stuff. That was Kelly Thompson. Thank you for being here, Kelly. Thanks so much, guys, for having me. I had a great time. Thank you. Thank you. And this Thanks. was Bat Force Radio, and we will see you next time.